Good afternoon, Bibliones. Thank you for your interest in Latin American studies. My name is Professor Andrea Lorena Fernandez, aka Cronista de Indias. And today's episode, season one, episode three, is titled La Malinche and La Chingada. And it's divided into two sections by the same name. The first one goes over Cortez's second letter again. You may want to reference episode two, season one to get the backstory on Hernán Cortés and the seven, minutes of the seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest. Then we give you the backstory by Malinche based on Svetan Todorov's analysis in the Conquest of America. The second part, La Chingada, analyzes a painting by Diego Rivera and an essay by Octavio Paz, Nobel Prize winner 1990. If you refer back to the previous episode, Hernán Cortés, in his narration of the second letter to Charles V, already evidences Barroco de Indias and the seven myths of the Spanish conquest. In the letter, he tells the king that an Indian woman brings testimony of a conspiracy in the city-state of Cholula, which he uses to launch a preemptive attack on said town and massacring absolutely everybody in the town. Um, in this letter, we already see the myth of the exceptional man. Hernán Cortés is portraying himself as positively as possible. This is a concept or a phenomenon called self-fashioning by Stephen Grimblatt. In fact, most verbs in the passage are told in the first person. And in fact, the whole letter, most of it is in the first person so that you get the sensation that Cortés is a one-man army with an interpretation attaché in the form of two people, Jerónimo de Aguilar and La Malinche. His eyewitness testimony brings up the theme of desengaño and disillusionment because Cortes's forces are making their way inland with this place of violence to intimidate Montezuma. Uh, the unreliable senses come into play as well. Yet, from Cortes's text, they have no choice but to attack based on a conspiracy. The second myth that you see in this letter is miscommunication. I quote, Y yo tomé uno de los naturales de las dicha ciudad que por allí andaba y le aparté secretamente que nadie lo vio y le interrogué y confirmó con lo que la India y los naturales de Tlaxcal me habían dicho. Translation, he found somebody else to corroborate the testimony by kidnapping a local native from Cholula and potentially torturing him into giving the same story that Malinche told. So the entire, uh, the entire strategy is based on the testimony of two people a lady and somebody who was tortured, not a reliable testimony. So who was Malinche that had so much power and sway over the conquistador? There are several names for her. The first one, Malinali, which in Nahual translates to a climbing plant. The second one, Malitzin, where tzin, the suffix, is a marker of nobility. So she was highly regarded even within her own community. Doña Marina, her Christian name, and last but not least, La Malinche, which is a combination of Marina and Malintzin, a corruption of the two. Was she a noblewoman then? Was she a slave? The answer is it could be both, but most likely she was a tongue. She was an interpreter. Um, she was stolen initially from central Mexico, uh, and she spoke Nahuatl as her native language. She was one of 19 women given to Hernán Cortés in the Gulf Coast by the Tabasco Nation. Both Spanish, natives, and Africans held interpreters in high esteem, so choosing this occupation was a clever move, if anything at all. Had, she also had a child by Hernán Cortés, named Martín Cortés, who is the first mixed-blood child in the Americas, the first mestizo. It is unlikely that Malinche and Cortés had sexual activity until after the fall of Tenochtitlan because she was simply too valuable to lose in childbirth for the expedition. So, and uh, towards the end of her life, she marries Juan de Jaramillo. She is the inspiration for the phenomenon of Malinchismo, or siding with foreigners against the motherland. Malinche reprises the idea of La Llorona, or sorrowful mother, as well. She speaks others' words, but remains silent in history herself. And she is typed as very many things culturally in the contemporary period. We see her betrayal, sexual, <coughs> sexual siren, feminist icon, Aztec goddess, mother of the first mestizo, and rape victim of the conquest. 
Svetan Todorov gives us a likely narration. So let's go ahead and read from Svetan. Her mother tongue is Nahual, the language of the Aztecs, but she has been sold as a slave to the Mayas and speaks their language as well. Hence, there is a rather long chain of interpreters at first. Cortés speaks to Aguilar, who the, then translates what he says to La Malinche, who in turn speaks to the Aztec interlocutor. In fact, she is not content to merely translate. It is evident that she also adopts the Spaniards' values and contributes as best she can to the achievement of their goals. On the other hand, she performs a sort of cultural conversion, interpreting for Cortés not only the Indians' words, but also their actions. On the other hand, she can take initiative when necessary and addresses appropriate words to Moctezuma, notably in the episode of his arrest, without Cortés actually having spoken them previously. The Mexicans, since their independence, have generally despised La Malinche as an incarnation of betrayal of indigenous values, of servile submission to the European culture and power. It is true that the conquest of Mexico would not have been possible without her or someone else playing the same role, so that she is responsible for what occurred. I myself see her in quite a different light, as the first example, and thereby symbol, of the crossbreeding of cultures, she thereby heralds the modern state of Mexico and beyond that, the present state of us all, since, we are, since if we are not invariably bilingual, we are inevitably bi or tricultural. La Malinche glorifies mixture to detriment of purity, Aztec or Spanish, and the role of the intermediary. She does not simply submit to others, a uh, case, unfortunately, much more common since we all think of the young Indian women offered, not, or taken by the Spaniards. She adopts the other's ideology and serves in order to understand her own culture better, as evidenced by the effectiveness of her conduct, even if understanding here means destroying. So La Malinche as an agent of bi-tricultural approaches. When we get to the 20th century, to paintings sponsored by the Mexican government after the Mexican Revolution from, uh, that ends in 1920, uh, artists like Diego Rivera canonify Mexican history on the walls of the National Palace. His murals of the history of Mexico, made from 1929 to 1935, depict La Malinche aside, uh, beside all of her cohort. He doesn't quite know how to interpret the interpreter. The best he can do is a lady who is standing there with a coquettish smirk, a raised skirt, and reveals tattooed legs. For official history, she's tough to depict without judging. In fact, here, the focus of the story is her tattooed inner thighs. Take a look at the painting, it's actually on the slide at the beginning of this presentation. Note that she's unfazed, actually, by the severed arm that is right next to her in the painting. So, Diego Rivera is not quite sure how to interpret the interpreter. And Octavio Paz, in The Labyrinth of Solitude, from 1950s, gives us the best approach. He teaches us what the word chingar means to the Mexican public. Chingar translates to to fuck. El chingón is the fucker. La chingada is the fucked. Make sure you remember those three, it's very important. Octavio Paz says, quote, La chingada is the mother who has suffered, metaphorically or actually, the corrosive and defaming action of implicit in the verb that gives her her name. The chingada is the mother forcibly opened, violated or deceived. The hijo de la chingada is the offspring of violation, abduction and deceit. If we compare this expression with the Spanish hijo de puta, or son of a whore, the difference is immediately obvious. To the Spanish, this honor consists of being the, sor the son of a woman who voluntarily surrenders herself, a prostitute. To the Mexican, it consists of being the fruit of a violation. This gives us two options for masculinity in Mexican and, yes, neighboring Hispanic cultures. You have either chingar, or chingado. The first, chingar. You impose your will on others through aggression. This is akin to masculinity, power, and the conquistador. Chingado, the other on, on the inverse, is enduring another's will with abnegation. This is closely related to femininity, powerlessness, and la malinche. The dichotomy between la malinche or 
La Chingada, and The Virgin Mother, or Guadalupe, is the topic for the next episode. The dichotomy between virgin and whore is so prevalent across the world that it's uh, it, it's not. I, I don't have to explain it much. In Latin America, however, the phenomenon of machismo is so well documented that I not I don't need to find a translation for the word machismo into English for you to understand that it denotes the cult of male virility and aggression. But what about its counterpart? Yes, it has a counterpart. It's called Marianismo. To understand the development of female behavioral codes in Latin America from Mediterranean cultures, you best tune in to the next installment of Latin American Divas, Season 1, Episode 4, Marianismo and Guadalupe. Don't lie, you probably really enjoyed learning how to say fuck in Spanish in yet another way. Um, if you like the channel, you the content have a thought please leave a comment below if you hit that subscribe button that will make us really happy in joining the revolution tune in on fridays for more latin american divas with your very own andrea lorena fernandez cronista de indias and remember do epic shit <laughs>